Good afternoon. I'm David Welter, state representative from Morris. My district includes portions of Grundy, Kendall, and Will counties and LaSalle. We're here today to shine a light on the concerns of crime victims regarding the impact of House Bill 3653, the criminal justice legislation that passed during the lame duck session in January, which is presently on the governor's desk. My main concern with this bill is that it enhances protections for individuals charged with violent crimes at the expense really of the victims of those crimes. Specifically, the bill eliminates cash bail. While I respect the arguments made by my colleagues who support making this change, I believe strongly, and so does a lot of our local law enforcement, that it makes our communities less safe and victims more vulnerable. Consider this disturbing scenario. Under the language of this bill, a dangerous individual charged with murder could be given no cash bail and walk pre-trial because under the law, they would no longer be considered a threat to their victim due to the fact that the person is dead because they killed them. Consider what effect this would have on the family of the victim and the community as a whole. A family who is mourning the loss of a loved one as a result of a violent crime should not be victimized further by watching the court system be compelled to allow the predator of that crime to avoid detention due to the elimination of cash bail. We're joined here today by Cassandra Tanner Miller, a constituent of mine who used to preside in Will County, somebody who I have worked with for over the last year now to be the voice for those victims who are no longer with us, who have lost their lives due to domestic violence. Cassandra is a victim and survivor who tragically lost her 18 month old son, Colton, in a horrific incident of domestic violence in September of 2019. I would now like to turn it over to Cassandra to share her experience during and since that incident and hear her perspective on how we as a state can better protect victims of crime. Cassandra? Hi, everybody. My name is Cassandra Tanner Miller. Um, I am a victim and a survivor of a domestic violence tragedy. On September 21st, 2019, my estranged husband broke into my house in the middle of the afternoon and he brutally beat me, strangled me, left me lifeless on the floor. And while I was dying slowly, he went up the stairs and he shot my 18 month old son Colton 10 times in his head. He then attacked my nine year old daughter, trying to hurl her over the railing while trying to load a gun and biting her. I got up the stairs and got in between and I was able to get Cameron away from him. Um, he shot fired at us as we were escaping the home. My neighbors dragged me to safety and then he shot and killed himself in our bathtub after committing the most horrendous acts that honestly I have to live with and I bear this every single day. Um, I thought that this bill to speak out against it because I live it daily. There are victims out there that who have lost their lives, who don't get a second chance, don't get a second voice. And I'm going to stand up and I'm going to speak for them. Um, as a state, we need to protect the families in Illinois to provide for a safer future by uniting all intergovernmental levels. House Bill 3653 will be a complete dismantling of the victim's safety and rights. Every police officer, lawyer, and judge determines our fate as victims, whether we live or die at the hands of our perpetrators. They are already bound by the laws set in place of how much help or protection that can be given to a victim. Illinois legislation needs to work together with the criminal justice system to ensure criminals who are knowingly breaking laws have accountability for their choices. Eliminating the cash bail will be detrimental to victims and more Christopher Millers will be walking out of the courthouse free to the public, putting victims and their family in direct danger. I know this personally because my son's murder, Christopher Miller, was facing three counts of aggravated felony battery in DuPage County. He posted his bond there and was going through the court system. 
Then he violated his bond in Cook County the first time, got a DUI, was released on an I bond. He violated it a second time a month before September 21st occurred in 2019. At that time, he was arrested for a class X felony for possession of cocaine, missing the trial that was supposed to be putting him behind bars, serving three to eight years of prison sentence for the aggravated felony batteries he was currently charging. Instead of keeping their revoking bond or putting conditions or cash bail in place, Cook County I bonded him out. The same no cash bail that everyone in this house bill thinks is going to keep us safer. Because at that point, it wasn't considered a violent crime that he would be held on. Well, unfortunately, the violent crime has already been part of the cycle. He's already had a system that he knew how to manipulate in and out of to not have to face the consequences, to not post bail, to be able to let out on a promise that he was going to return when his promise meant nothing because he was a known criminal who was willing to break laws, just like the ones that are going to continue to happen when this bill gets put into effect. More Christopher Millers are going to be let out, putting victims, especially domestic violence victims in harm's way. One arrest for a certain thing could mean the next result of a snowball effect that occurred when he went in for his supposed to status hearing where they should have revoked it. They should have kept him, but they didn't. On September 17th, he was released and four days later, he committed murder in my home. I sit here every single day struggling, wondering what we could be doing to help protect people. The criminal justice system needs reform, but this is not reform. This is dismantling. This is taking everything everyone's worked before and taking it away from them. I'd like to ask just one final thing on all of this. <clears throat> is which one of you who supported this bill and is supporting it currently is going to come to my house and tell my daughter that she and those like her are safer with this new bill? If Christopher Miller had to post money that day when he was arrested or his bond conditions were revoked or stricter, her little brother, my son Colton, who's in the pictures behind me, would be celebrating his third birthday this month on February 26th. He would be turning three. Instead, he hangs in a cross around my neck and he hangs in a pendant that's in the shape of a teddy bear around my 10 year old daughter's neck. And that's the only question I have left is that, that how are you going to explain that this is going to keep people safer when it's giving limitations and it's setting more people out there to commit crime without accountability and be released into the general public? Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. I'm Mike Marin from the 104th district, which includes parts of Vermillion and Champaign counties. I am here today joining my colleagues and our guests to discuss the very serious consequences that HB 3653 will have for victims of crime. We feel HB 3653 as passed leaves a confusing patchwork of definition, definition that could ultimately cause more pain and suffering to victims and their families. I've received an overwhelming number of calls, emails, and messages from my constituents, concerned that their voices are not being heard in Springfield. They are concerned for the future safety for themselves and for the state of Illinois if HB 3653 becomes law. I understand the desire to work on criminal justice initiatives. I'm also not opposed to every single part of this bill. There are serious concerns, however, for, from the public and from law enforcement officials that I have spoken to in my communities about how HB 3653 will ultimately impact the victims of crime. My largest community, Danville, has seen a large spike in crime over the last two decades. We see the numbers coming in from Chicago showing some of the highest crime rates and gun violence numbers the city has ever seen. Our society is based on the rule of law. Because of that rule of law, we have freedom and we have safety. I believe that legal consequences are necessary 
for people that commit serious crimes. The end of cash bail and the confusion surrounding pre-trial detention, <clears throat> surrounding pre-trial detention are issues I know are particularly concerning to law enforcement officials and to state's attorneys around Illinois. I have taken some time to read the legislation and digest some of the changes. However, and I think my guest will agree, that even some of the best attorneys out there still do not exactly know how the judicial system will deal with certain individuals after they are arrested for very, very serious crimes. The final product that passed the House and Senate lacked bipartisan support and left out major concerns expressed by law enforcement, advocacy groups, and an overwhelming majority of the state's attorneys in Illinois. We need to hear from our law enforcement officials on issues like this. Governor Pritzker, I hope you are listening to the public officials on the ground that will have to deal with the real world impacts of these sweeping changes. That is why I am happy to introduce my Vermillion County State's Attorney, Jacqueline Lacey, who deals firsthand every day with both criminals and victims in my home county. Ms. Lacey is here to provide her on the ground perspective as to the consequences for law enforcement officials and victims of violent crime if HB 3653 becomes law. Jacqueline. Uh, Jacqueline, sorry to interrupt, you're muted right now. Sorry, I apologize. Um, I just want to say that House Bill 33 threat to public safety. Most people don't see the cycle of violence and domestic violence like we do in our Vermillion County Courthouse every single day. And most state's attorneys see across this state and across this nation every day. And the cycle of violence is something that is real for our victims. When you are in a domestic violence situation, and I just would like the governor and everyone else who's listening to close your eyes and think about years of abuse, being married, and in years of abuse, you have finally picked up the phone and called 911. Your spouse has beat you within an inch of your life and you're terrified. You're looking for the police to call, to come. You want them to come and lock up this man who has probably been abusing you for most of your life. You finally get the courage to do that. Maybe it's only a case where we can charge domestic battery, which is a class A misdemeanor because it's his first offense. And there's not great bodily harm as defined by the law. And then that same defendant at his pretrial hearing will call you as a witness and confront you while you're still dealing with the trauma of calling 911, of finally turning in your abuser. This is the type of fact pattern that we deal with day in and day out. Our poor victims struggle to even come forward. Many times I am able as state's attorney now to, to allow them to hide behind me. I will ask for the bond. I will proffer the facts. I will indicate to the court what is um, provable and what evidence we have against him and get a bond set and protect you and do the best we can to protect you. And those very same victims will not be protected by House Bill 3653. They will be re-victimized over and over and over again. And the cycle of violence that they were so strongly able to finally fight against will continue to go on in their homes. And for those victims, they will suffer tremendously and we will maybe in the future be investigating their homicide rather than protecting them from their abuser. The other issue with House Bill 3653 that I find extraordinarily shocking is in gun violence. Gun violence, you have to describe a specific victim which, which a perpetrator, um, excuse me, which the defendant would essentially um, be a threat to if released on pretrial release. Take for a minute and think about an aggravated discharge to a residence. One gang is shooting against another gang. There's a high speed chase and the officers are finally able to stop the vehicle in which the shooters are in. Nobody inside the residence is cooperative. They're all gang members. But all those individuals that live in that community and have to wake up and go to work in that community are frankly quite terrified, terrified within their lives. Every single day they live in terror 
Those individuals that are stopped in the car are felons. They have a gun in their possession. And because of that, we have to describe a specific person that they are a threat to, even though we know that they're gonna be charged with unlawful use of a weapon by a felon and they are a threat to our community. Those individuals will walk. The prosecution in my job is to make sure that I show the court clear and convincing evidence. I certainly can't show clear and convincing evidence if I don't have a specific individual that I can point to that these individuals are a threat to. And they talk about specifically naming those individuals. The other issue is once you have a perpetrator in custody, they're allowed to look at their cell phones and pick up cell phone numbers and get information from their cell phones. They're allowed multiple phone calls. We deal day in and day out with threats to our witnesses and to our victims. And this is going to give the defendants more access to threaten our victims, threaten our witnesses. If the community thinks it's difficult now to get people to come forward and speak out against violent crime, against individuals that are committing violent crimes in their own communities, it's going to be far more difficult when we have a defendant in custody charged and he's able to reach out to those individuals or to his friends and make sure that those witnesses and victims are taken care of. You know, a lot of people talk about pretrial services. Well, these people are gonna be managed and monitored in the community and it's gonna be fine. And we're just gonna ask them to come to court and please show up. Criminals don't follow the law. And we certainly don't have enough individuals in order to supervise the defendants out in the community on pretrial release, especially for the violent crimes. Prosecutors across the state, across the nation, make difficult decisions every day. And I can tell you from being a defense attorney and a public defender for 13 years, every decision I make as a prosecutor is likelihood of conviction. I'm not charging somebody with a crime unless I think I can convict them. And I certainly don't think that House Bill 3653 is a positive situation for the victims, for the witnesses of crimes in our communities and I hope that um, at the end of the day that the governor certainly won't sign this bill. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm State Representative Chris Boss, uh, was recently sworn in to represent the 51st District, which covers several communities in Central and Southwest Lake County, as well as a small portion of suburban Cook County. As the previous speakers have pointed out, reform within our criminal justice system uh, to address critical problems is needed. But it's also clear that the way House Bill 3653 was rushed through at the 11th hour has created some very concerning issues that could have devastating consequences for victims. Since I was not yet sworn in uh, when the bill was passed, I was not able to vote on it. But as a victim's advocate, I felt I had to speak out. I work with an organization called Reclaim 13. It's a nonprofit that works to free children from sexual exploitation by focusing on uh, prevention programs for adolescents and adults and healing programs for children and young adults of human trafficking. Uh, Reclaim 13 also runs the only safe house in the state of Illinois for these underage victims. So when I consider that under House Bill 3653, a victim, like a child who's been sexually abused and trafficked, could be compelled to face their attacker at a hearing within hours of an assault or from being rescued from a trafficker, I'm frankly at a loss. The trauma would cause, the trauma that would cause this victim is unthinkable. As a father of two daughters, one in high school and one in elementary school, and I also spent much time with these children who are recovering and healing from their abuse, that thought of putting them through that again would makes my stomach turn. I'm amazed by the courage of Cassandra, uh, who already spoke. To have the strength to tell her story is something many victims will never be able to do. Her story and others like it are exactly why House Bill 3653 should be vetoed and a more thorough public debate and vetting process that includes all stakeholders is able to take place. Then all victims, whether they're a victim of the failures in the criminal justice system or victims of violent crime can be protected. 
Thank you all for your time today, and we'll, we will now open it up for questions. Thank you to all who participated here today. Uh, we'll start with the questions that we're getting um, from Dave Dahl at WTX. Uh, seeing as how this has already passed the legislature and awaits the governor's action, how do you want people to respond to what we're saying here today? Yeah, I can take that. Well, I think what we'd like how how we'd like people to respond is for them to help educate themselves, whether it's reaching out to your local legislators, those that supported the bill and those who opposed the bill, to try to hear their opinions and their mindset in terms of why they supported or didn't support this bill. But ultimately, it's been sent to the governor's desk at this point. And really the responsibility whether to sign this bill or not to sign this bill now lies in his hands. So reaching out to the governor's office, letting your legislators know how you feel, both those who support and opposed it, and reach out, I mean, reach out to your local law enforcement community as well and, and get their thoughts on why they're concerned about the bill. Educate yourself because there's so much misinformation or information that's not complete because this bill is so large and we passed it with only not even hours to review 700 pages. And we're still finding out provisions of this bill that are both negative and areas that we have concerns. So again, it, it really lies with the governor at this point in putting pressure on him to veto the bill, mandatorily veto the bill and allow the legislature to come back and do our job. If we really want a good product it should be bipartisan. Republicans have a desire for criminal justice reform, but include us. Hear our thoughts, hear our concerns, and work with us. Thank you. Um, a, a little bit of a follow-up to that that you began to address. Uh, how much are Republicans willing to commit for the criminal justice system, including prisons, to be the size necessary to accommodate the number of people you want to be in it? I, I want to say a uh, number of people that we want to be in prison. I mean, obviously, uh, we believe in second chances. We believe in giving people opportunities to help better themselves. But what I would say is if you look back at history, you will see that Republicans have engaged with Democrats on criminal justice reform. Look at our leader, Leader Durkin. He's been involved with some historic reforms, but that's because we were included. We were respected. We were at the table and we negotiated. And we came up with a product that both sides felt would be reasonable and appropriate for the citizens of Illinois. Let's get back to that. Why shut out one side and ignore our ideas or our concerns? Again, you want to get something done, work with us. We are willing to work with you. I would add as, as well, when you ask us how much we're willing to commit, I would say, of course, you know, we're under, we're um, in unprecedented circumstances right now because we don't know how bad the budget is going to ultimately be affected from the fallout of COVID which is all the more reason when we're talking about these things that have impact on the budget for Republicans to be at the table. But unfortunately, this whole process, we were shut out. And so that's just one more reason why I think we need to start over again. And, you know, certainly when you talk about making commitments to, to spend money on things like criminal justice, in my opinion, when we're prioritizing things, public safety needs to be at the top of the list. And we're willing to engage on that, just like uh, Representative Welter said, you know, uh, we're for criminal justice reform, but we want to be part of the process. We want to be part of a bill that makes sense. So I encourage the governor to, to veto this bill and let's start over again. We're happy to come to the table. Thank you. Um, from the center square, the measure has been sent to the governor today while it only passed with 60 votes in the House, why is that not enough of a mandate for it to become a law? You know, one reason why it's not a mandate, in my opinion, is because it passed in lame duck session, voted on by people who uh, are no longer state representatives. And, and you know, I, I think it's just unbelievable that we are undertaking reforms, quote unquote reforms, that are gonna completely change uh, uh, you know, how we've done business for years and have a huge impact on society in a last minute of a lame duck session voted on by people who are no longer accountable to the voters. And so I think that just pretty much wrecks any mandate that the other side can claim on this bill. And, and not just that, Mike, we were both there that day and it was within what an hour or two before the new 102nd General Assembly was sworn in. But 
you recall being on the House floor, they left that, that roll call vote open for how long because it barely reached the 60 votes. It didn't reach the 60 votes until the last minute. I imagine there was some arm twisting on the other side to get that bill to that 60 votes. So by no means was this a mandate. They pulled out all the tricks and stops to get this thing passed. Thank you. Um, from Mike Militech at Quincy Media Group, why would groups supporting domestic violence survivors support the Pre-Trial Fairness Act if it's worth for them, worse for them as you believe? And I don't know if anyone's able to answer that question or... I, I can try, and I don't know if any of the guests wanted to, to chime in on that, but what I, what I would say is I was concerned when I started to see some advocacy groups out there coming out in support of this bill, even prior to some changes being made. And, and I can't speak specifically to why, but what I can see and what I see in this talking to victims is uh, the state's attorney on this call talked about it earlier, um, giving defend, uh, defendants more access to communications when they are apprehended, uh, potentially tampering with witnesses and victims, uh, threatening them possibly. And then you have the fact that you can compel a victim now within short order after a, a domestic violence situation to have to potentially, the defense could potentially call them as a witness and force them to testify when they had just gone through this traumatic event. I am having a hard time seeing where this allows and provides more protections. Now, I know they talk about in the bill, you know, better communications among groups and, and, and making sure that the judge truly uh, uh, considers the facts, but I don't see any teeth in it. And, and frankly, uh, without having larger dialogue with those groups, I, I, I feel like they did something that wasn't very good for victims at the expense of trying to uh, get on board with the overall thought of, of, of maybe social justice in this, but I, I think they did a disservice to the victims that they're supposed to be representing from the victims I've talked to at least. Thank you. Can I maybe just briefly respond to that question as well? Of course. I don't know what specific victims groups have come out in support of this, but I can quite frankly say that um, they probably haven't read the bill or they didn't read the entire bill, or they haven't thought about how it practically affects every day in the courtroom. Um, they're overturning you know, hundreds of years of jurisprudence in a matter of an hour and 45 minutes. Um, and I think that there are a lot of talking, talking points. There's a lot of propaganda out there, but if you sit down and actually read the bill, this is not positive for victims and this does not protect our communities. Thank you. Um, another question, existing law did not stop Christopher Miller, unfortunately. So what really should be done? What bill would you guys consider introducing? Well, I would say, you know, first of all, the, the trends that we've seen uh, lately, at least since I've been in Springfield, are disturbing, uh, where you give more and, and more credence to the person that's accused of the crime. Ever since I've been in Springfield, we've been under this moratorium where we're not going to increase penalties in the house. Uh, you know, no bill that increases uh, penalties for criminals is allowed to see the light of day. And in my opinion, there is no excuse uh, for the actions of somebody like Chris Miller. There's just not. There's no amount of, of you know, problems that he's had in society that can excuse that kind of behavior. And so I would actually look at, at strengthening uh, penalties against people uh, that participate in, in things like domestic violence uh, because there's absolutely no excuse for it. I think we need to, to make things tougher on, on people like that. And I, I think Cassandra may have something to add to that as well. You're going to have to unmute yourself, Cassandra. David Wilder and I had started. Oh, here we go. Um, we can just hear you now if you want to restart. Sorry, I delayed there. There we go. Uh, okay. So as everybody knows, when David and I started this, we had started Colton's Task Force was our original house bill that we had introduced. And it unanimously got passed through the committee on Colton's second birthday. And then COVID hit. And then we went into this recession where we were no longer progressively moving forward. At the same time, um, DuPage County 
they had given a bill that was could be called Colton law and that specifically is going to make stricter bond conditions um, that Christopher Miller, my murderer, my son's murder, um, was able to avoid because the criminal justice system currently is set up to make sure that criminals retain rights that they knowingly are actively going against every single day. Um, the bond conditions that Christopher should have had was the revocation of weapons. He had his void revoked originally. And during this and bond conditions, there are boxes that are supposed to be checked where if guns are part of it, um, former cases can be used and piled together to be able to make sure that people are aware that Christopher had suffered several times from other counts of battery. And each time that we are able to take a criminal and look at the whole cycle of their criminal history and behavior, I think in general is going to be the safest way that we are actually going to be helping victims in the state and giving further protection and prevention. We are a reactive state instead of proactive. And unfortunately that causes the consequences of death. And we need to work together. Like I said from the very beginning, this is not a Republican thing. This is not a democratic thing. This is an Illinois thing. This is a world thing. This is something we need to work together to be able to press progressively move from what we currently have in the court system, look at the flaws that are able to Chris Miller, take victims, victims words, sit down with the victim. I'm your number one person. You could sit and look at each flaw that was missed to be able to create a safer system. Why are they not looking at a victim such as Cassandra Tanner Miller or other victims who are able to speak out and say, where was the missing points of this that we could work together progressively to move forward, to make sure that these flaws and these gray areas do not happen again. So Christopher Miller isn't a person that is going to continue to evolve and become the person that he had became when he murdered my son. So ultimately to answer that question of what can we do to further it? You need to do what we were trying to do originally was to create a task force, to create Colton's law, to help with bonds and make sure things our provisions are not overlooked and that we are looking at bigger picture and bigger scope of it. And ultimately looking at the criminal behavior, lifestyle activities and taking those risk assessments and algorithms that we've created. And we have to create bigger ones that help eliminate the gray area for Illinois to become safer. Thank you. Um, and then we have time for one last question from the SJR. The Black Caucus says Republicans and law enforcement had many chances to give input at hearings. What is your response to that? Well, I'll jump in. I wasn't, I'll go, go ahead. I was, I was briefly, I wasn't there, wasn't a, uh, be able to be a part of those those conversations, but from the floor that I was sitting in the back watching on, it didn't matter. 760 some pages, minutes to read it, or hours to read it before a vote on it, no de of a very little debate allowed on it, and then holding a vote uh, until they could get their way goes to show that even, there was no way to even know if the input was received, if the advice was taken, if bipartisan collaboration was happening in this bill. That's the biggest challenge with it right now. And one of the things that we need to address to move this forward. I, I will say that, you know, there were some hearings over the fall in the middle of a pandemic when we haven't even met together as a General Assembly since May. There, there were some, some hearings, but we didn't get the opportunity to to offer any input into those hearings. And I've spoken with uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, the sheriffs, uh, the, the Chiefs Association. None of those uh, law enforcement officials, the leaders in those organizations had any opportunity, uh, according to them, that's, that's, that's what they've told me. Uh, they got in uh, on some negotiations at the very tail end before this passed uh, and and got a little bit of input, but you know this is a major major piece of legislation that has serious impact on our society, and this is not the process. This was not a good process, 
Uh, we all should have had input on this. It shouldn't have been done in a lame duck session. It shouldn't have been done in the middle of a pandemic when the General Assembly hadn't even met for seven and a half months. And then all of a sudden we rush it through in the last minute. There's there's something not right about that. Thank you. And um, thanks to everybody who uh, joined the press conference. If you have follow-up questions or we didn't get to a question, just please uh, follow back up with me and we will make sure to get all the questions answered. And with that, I just want to say thank you um, to the Vermillion County State's Attorney, as well as to Cassandra Tanner Miller uh, for joining us today and especially to Cassandra for sharing her story. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Can I say one last final thing? Of course. Um, this is on Governor Pritzker's desk, and this is directly for you, Governor Pritzker. When we sat in the office and you sat across from me and I shared my story with you and you shook my hand, you promised me that you were going to work together to make sure there was never another Colton Miller in the state. You asked me what we could do and you shook my hand and you hugged me and you promised me this house bill that you're going to pass, that you want to pass, that's sitting there, you may or may not, and you can veto it. You have that power to be able to bring our state together to make sure that there's not another Colton Miller. I ask you to think back to that day that we sat there and you asked what you could do. This is what you could do. You could take a step back and you could work together with all of us to create a safer Illinois so that there is not another little boy. You said I was tenacious that day this is my tenacity speaking to you now. Please, I beg you to actually think of all the little kids and the women and men that are sitting there that don't have their babies anymore. It's easy for you to sit there and sign and put a pen to paper, but realize there are families that are going to be begging, begging for a second chance, begging for a second voice. I want you to give that to them. I want you to make sure we are all working together that everyone has a voice in this because this affects everyone's future. That's all that I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Cassandra. We really appreciate your courage in being here today. Um, and with that, please, if anybody has any follow-up questions, please just reach out to me. Thank you.